We have a few people attending today who indicated that they are new to the FDP program and would like to learn more. The FDP Institute provides world-class training and education to financial professionals to meet the accelerating needs of digital transformation in the industry. The Financial Data Professional Institute was established by Kaya Association to address the growing need in finance for a workforce that has the skills to perform in a digitized world, where an increasing number of decisions will be data and analytic driven. The FDP credential is the first of its kind in the industry and reflects expertise in data science and its practical applications in finance. To earn the FDP designation, candidates have to complete either Python or R classes. These can be completed either before or after the exam. The comprehensive exam contains 80 multiple choice questions and two to four constructed response questions. There are no programming questions on the FDP exam. So I wanna welcome you to today's webinar. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Hossein Kazimi, Senior Advisor of the FTP Institute. Welcome, Hossein. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thank you, Apur, for uh, agreeing to do this uh, very exciting webinar, uh, very exciting topic, and actually very, quite relevant. So I'm Hossein Kazemi, uh, the director of FTP Institute, as well as a consultant to the Kaya Association. And I'm very happy to have approved. So could you please tell us about your background and so on, approve and how you became interested in this area? Sure thing. So once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening <laughs> to everybody joining. So Hussein, my background is a little unusual. Like I, uh, it's a mix of trading research and data science. So as a buy side PM, I ran a $3 billion single name book. I traded FX Exotics at Deutsche Bank, worked at Bridgewater. Um, and as a data scientist at Microsoft Research and visiting researcher at Harvard, I published some papers on machine learning and macro in top journals. Uh, and we actually won a best paper award last year. And I also, this is a highlight for me. I got, I got to publish a paper on machine learning with, with Professor Datar, who just became the Dean at Harvard Business School. And then finally, I learned how to design ML platforms at Microsoft, so one of the best places to do that, uh, where, I, you know, where I recruited and led a team of researchers, uh, traders and data engineers. It was this you know, mixed team uh, to deliver signals for our internal alternative database fund. I mean, it's, it's really was a hedge fund. Uh, and we also did projects with external managers like Acadian and Vinton. So, and finally, all of this came together, you know, where we said, well, you know, global economic measurement needs to be, needs a revolution. Uh, so, and then, so we came, came, this all came together and we launched MacroX out of San Francisco. All right, well, thank so you. Should I go yes, please. now? Or? Please go ahead, yes, thank you. Okay, great. So guys, so today I want to talk about null casting. Uh, so there are three big things that I would really like to address. The first is null casting and the three fundamental problems of macro data. Uh, the second is, uh, if you take away one thing, that's alternative data are not just an ML problem, okay? And the third will bring it all together in a case study that deals with non-farm payrolls. So first, and most of this material is from uh, the book chapter I wrote for machine learning and data sciences for financial markets that's being published by Cambridge University Press in 2023. So the preprint uh, will be available on SSRN and Kim. Uh, I think we'll send out a link afterwards. So what's, what's the fundamental problems of macro data? So government data poorly measure the economy one to three months in the past with lots of indicators. So uh, as, a, as a PM and on the buy side, like the biggest data release uh, in the world arguably is on from payrolls. So think back to May, 2020 when COVID uh, unfortunately was hitting all of us. And at that time, the consensus for non from payrolls, the jobs report was that it was going to be minus 8 million. And so this is the consensus of all Wall Street, kind of Goldman and 
all different banks, like which are very reputed. And the actual number came out at plus two and a half million. So it's quite a divergence. What was interesting for me was that that was the headline where it said, well, the next, if this was confusing, well, the next report is going to be even more confusing. And you know, you, you don't need a, a PhD in machine learning to know, for example, and this is data from the World Bank, uh, that this time series needs to be continuous. So data all over the world, uh, you know, is, is not in very good shape. Uh, Bill Gates got so frustrated about this, and he wrote this editorial saying, well, the problem with poor countries GDP, uh, where, you know, if, for example, they reduce uh, malaria in a country, we know it has a positive effect on the economic prosperity of the country. But if 24 out of 45 sub-Saharan African countries are not measuring their GDP properly, it's very difficult to argue exactly how much. So now let's break it apart. So the first problem was there's many indicators or the high dimensionality. Uh, so when you go to Fred, for just for the US alone, you have 817,000 data sources that are tracked. Second is the staggered release schedule. So, you know, different data come out at different dates. So for example, PMI come, came out October 3rd, non-farm payrolls October 7th, and then they also have different frequencies. So jobless claims comes out every week. Lots of these data come out every month and then GDP releases every quarter. So that's called the jagged edge. The third, the poor data quality is not new. So just as another example, you know, back about back in the big financial crisis of 2008. So imagine you're Ben Bernanke at the time and you know, you're facing the, one of the worst financial crises of all time. And you want to know the GDP, just you know, what that would be helpful to do monetary policy. Right, so the this, this figure on the left traces the estimates of 2007 Q4 GDP. Okay, so it started around 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 uh, in January 2008 when it will be released, prelim estimate, and then it came, became negative by July 2008. It got revised down to be slightly negative, and then a couple of years later, they said, "Well, no, actually, it was very high, about three percent." And then finally, five years later, in July 2013, it came down to one and a half percent. So, so that's quite a ride for a GDP estimate for the same quarter. Now, we are all sitting here worried about how aggressive the Fed is going to be this time. So Orphanides at MIT wrote these papers saying, well, if the input is so volatile, the monetary policy can be off by plus or minus one and a half percent. Then he, so I, you know, I encourage you to read this amazing paper. So, so that's quite alarming. And this is the state of affairs in one of, if not the most sophisticated country on the planet. So that brings us to, that's the summary of the three fundamental problems of dimensionality, staggered release schedule of the jagged edge and the poor data quality. So as a result, you know, when we think about the challenges investment professionals face, where active managers struggle to prove their worth, uh, and then as well as the social challenges we face, such as measuring sustainable development goals or knowing what's, what's going on with us. So we are all familiar with the investment challenge. So I'll point a little bit to the social challenges. So I grew up in India and something amazing is happening there that lots of villages are getting access to electricity. So, so that's climb, that's the percentage of, in the red line is the percentage of electricity access to Indian villages. So it's really amazing, it's climbing to almost 100%. Now, India is going to become the most populous country, people say in about 10 years or so. So what we do with uh, renewable electricity is very important, not just to us, but to the health of the entire planet. However, the data for that, like well, what percentage of electricity in India is renewable? Well, the data only goes back to 20, 2015. So if you're missing all this data, it's difficult to know if all these villages that are getting electricity, was it from renewable sources mostly or not, or what's really going on? So MIT, you know, some people at MIT, including Professor Rigobon, 
wrote this amazing paper, you know, on the aggregate confusion of ratings. So, so that's so that's something uh, that we the society suffers from. So our insight was to say, well, if we look at emerging countries, emerging governments on two key dimensions of data, which are accuracy and coverage. So emerging countries are, you know, not very accurate and they don't cover a lot of, uh, you know, in-depth uh, data. Additionally, they're about two months black, right, typically. So that's the minus two months. So, so they're kind of in the bottom left quadrant of accuracy and coverage and they're two months lag. So developed governments, they tend to be a little more accurate, they cover a little more, but they still tend to be about a month lag. Uh, so our insight was, well, what if you combined social data, which can be a little leading, has you know, some accuracy and, and good coverage, along with micro data, such as online, credit card, debit card, accounting, et cetera, uh, and sensor, uh, which is emissions, nightlife, mobile phone data. So if you combine all of these, then you can get to the top right quadrant of accuracy and coverage. So that's that's our inside admission. So now let's talk a little bit about the basics of nowcasting. So the hi history, the nowcasting of forecasting the present, that's what it really means, is borrowed from meteorology. So if you think about your phone and you want to check the weather or if you go online, then you kind of know, well, what's, what's the weather going to be right now? And, you know, uh, and then in the next few hours, and so in the near future, as well as for the next few days. So it gives you a very accurate idea of the weather. And this is a triumph of technology and science because it didn't used to be like that. Like we were not very good at predicting or not passing the weather. And then now, you know, millions of variables and very sophisticated models are used. And now they are extremely accurate and do a great job. And economics, where we are still learning from other fields, this is the beginning of the journey for us. So hopefully we can, you know, get even closer to knowing the economic weather in the near term and in the future, rather than three months behind. So let's talk about an economic now. So same thing, it's current, it's model-based and replicable, uh, it's continuously updated. Uh, and it's time granular, right? So you can look at it on an hourly basis and for weather, but for economics, like maybe on a daily or a weekly basis. Uh, and it's an information rich summary. So it has a lot of signal uh, for rather than noise. And all of it approximates a key concept like economic growth. So economic growth, you know, is extremely difficult to measure uh, because it literally is the sum of all of our activities. It also includes debates like should the work being done at home be counted as a GDP or not? So, so there are some accounting debates. So that's why, in my in my idea, it will always remain an approximation to this very complex concept. So, so, so we just hope that it's a very good approximation. So bringing it all together, so it's the economic weather. Uh, you know, that's what you're trying to get for key concepts like growth. So now there are many ways to now cast uh, economic growth. So this, so, so this is an example of U.S. through COVID. So, so that's that's the kind of the the rust uh, like shows the COVID cases. And now let's look at different federal reserves. So these are pretty sophisticated models that were developed by different branches of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. by researchers. And and this rectangular gray bars represent the actual quarter and quarter US GDP. And then for example, the dash dot, that's the New York Fed. So you can see how the New York Fed tracked uh, this GDP. Uh, and then the Atlanta Fed has a slightly different model. So it tracked the GDP, you know, somewhat similarly with a little bit more volatility and seeming, you know, more accurately. Uh, and then Chicago Fed has their current activity index and this will be scaled for the GDP levels. And they, they were a little earlier in the morning and then they did this. And then Philly Fed, they have a business conditions index. So it's not exactly tracking or now casting the economy, but since GDP is such a big part of the business conditions, we did put it here. So they had a little bit of an early warning, uh, you know, and then, then came back down fast. So the point is there are many ways to forecast or now cast 
uh, the current situation. Uh, and these are a few of them. And it depends really on the purpose that you have. But the key, but all of them have this key insight from Stock and Watson at the heart of the model. And on this chart, they're showing if you take lots of, so the colored lines show lots of data that relate to employment. So there's about 35 economic series that all relate to employment that, that we've taken. Uh, and the thick black line is actually the first principle component. That's just one way to measure the you know, unknown state variable. Um, and the key insight of Stock and Watson is that a very a few common factors can capture most of the information uh, in all these many, many data. So that's one of the key insights. Well, the second insight is this factor can have state-space dynamics. So you can, you can model the dynamics of this factor in a state-space framework, uh, and typically with common filters uh, and smoother things like that. So I won't go into that, but if you are interested in the details of that, that's all in the book chart. Now, what is now so exciting? So this was the old school macro uh, now casting frameworks that you know that use common filters and rely on this key insight. So what's what's so new about alternative data and ML that is making our testing exciting? Uh, so in my opinion, uh, is the is the fact that we can now address the third fundamental problem, the poor data quality, and potentially know a bit more about turning points. So the, just to be clear, the old school factor modeling state-based approach was very successful in addressing the high dimensionality, as well as the, the jagged edge, the staggered release schedule. However, they were not generating new data, right? So it's very difficult for them to address the poor data quality. So that is now the promise of alternative data analysis. So now that brings us to the key questions. Well, which variables, right? So, so if, if we are going to use alternative data, well, which variables should we pick or how should we do this? So now if you think high dimensionality was a problem before, so just to give you a sense of the problem, so we have 12 recessions, right? Like, so these are the, you know, gray bars that show the recessions. In 12 recessions in the US since 1950, that red tracks. And then you have 818,000 data points to, to predict them or not cause them, right? So that's a tough, that's the very, that is the curse of dimensionality. So if this was bad before, then, then if you add so many 500 million tweets a day, 294 billion emails, and all these amazing alternative data sources, uh, with an insane amount of data that's coming at us, well, the problem just got a lot worse. So what should we do? So one, one option is to use academic papers to pick variables, right? So maybe we should do this. But this is an incredible paper uh, by Ionides at Stanford that says why most published research findings are false. So, so just as an illustration, like what they did was they picked a cookbook and they said, well, it has all these ingredients, wine, tomatoes, tea, sugar, salt, et cetera. And which of these are supposed to cause cancer? So each dot represents an academic paper. So it would seem that for example, wine, so some of the paper and, and one, by the way, this line through the center, it means it has no risk of causing cancer. On the left, if, if the number is low, that means it, you know, it lowers the odds of getting cancer. So the relative risk is low on the right. It, if it's high, it means it's a very high chance of getting cancer, right? So on the right means this ingredient causes cancer. On the left means it, it prevents cancer. So it seems that wine, for example, well, some papers say, well, you know, it seems to help with cancer, lowers the odds of cancer. Some people say, no, 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 don't drink it. It, it increases the odds of cancer. So, you know, if, if you're confused about it, uh, you know, some newspapers will publish it's great. Some will say, oh, it's terrible. So that's what's going on. So, so research, uh, you know, each paper can be very noisy and divides it up, right? And then uh, back to home to finance, Lopez de Prado, Barry, and others have done some incredible work where they show where the dash, you know, blue line is the high sharp ratio that is being published. However, the real or the deflated sharp ratio, that's the red line, that's really much lower. 
as you actually, you know, as you overfit the data more and more, or as you do more number of trials, you actually get the T stab and start torturing the data. So you cannot just rely on academic papers. Maybe we can use machine learning to pick the variables, right? So, so this on the this shows three different scenarios. So what you know, Tip Shirani and others did, what they said they took 20 variables, actual variables, and simulated a data set and uh, which to total 100 observations, right? So 20 variables, 100 observations. And then they said, well, let's just use lasso. That's a very popular machine learning technique that seems to identify the variables because it drives the others to zero. And then let's see if lasso can reduce the mean squared error and re-identify the right number of variables from this data set. So if with 100 observations and 20 variables, lasso is very successful and you need very low amount of regularization so you can see that on the left. So you see very need low amount of regularization. So if you regularize it too much so that you have only one variable left, well, then the mean squared error is high. So, so just to be clear on the left, the y-axis in mean squared error. So if it's high, that means it's bad. So this is bad and this is the best. So when it's 20 variables, bam, you know, below amounts of regularization, identify the right number of variables, we are all good. Now with the same 100 data points, if you throw in 50 variables, well, then things are a little harder. You, you need to, there's a middle ground where you, you know, some amount of uh, penalization is helpful, but if you over penalize or under over penalize here or under penalize, it increases the mean square error. So here it's getting a little harder to identify, you know, what is the right number of variables. Now, what if you explode the number of variables to 2,000? So think back to the 12 recessions and you know, 10 million data points. So, so this is a little bit like that. So you say, well, there's 2,000 variables, only 100 total observations. Well, there's no degree of regularization that can really re-identify it with great accuracy. So the mean squared error is just going to be high. So the point is, is very difficult to just use machine learning. Just, just I'm going to toss it into a machine learning model. So that that doesn't seem to work. So there's something we did where we actually looked at the wisdom of a crowd. So the Fred uh, Fred researchers collaborated with us, and we actually asked them, Hey, what is the what are the indicators people are paying attention to? So think of it a little bit like a Google Trends of of the Fred indicators. So it turns out that this is a total power law. So most of the people this, you know, pay attention to unemployment rate. This here is not labeled, but it's inflation. Unemployment rate, inflation, GDP, et cetera. So this, these are the things people really care about and pay attention to. And then lots of other things that decline very rapidly in importance. So that again brings us to the insight that there is a few key variables or a few key things that can capture most of the, most of the interesting points. So our suggestion, is to generate hypotheses about the very specific data dimension that can be proved. So what do I mean by that? So data dimensions, so traditional data versus alternative data has been different dimensions. So for example, can be like timeliness, coverage, accuracy, et cetera. <clears throat> so we can say something like, well, I believe searches are going to be instantaneous and there's a lots of them. So potentially, the thing they can help with is timeliness, that they can be instantaneous. And since people search before they do, like if you're gonna buy a car, you search for different models and what's going on before you actually buy the car. So it can even be a little leading. So that's, that's a hypothesis that depends on the property of the data where you're like, well, this is why I think it will be leading and timeliness dimension is what it should address. And secondly, I think it's going to address accuracy because we have billions of searches. <clears throat> On the other hand, most of these traditional surveys are going to be, you know, they're, they're, they're surveying only a fraction of the population. On the other hand, you may argue, well, the coverage, but these surveys are very carefully designed. Uh, and my alternative, some of the alternative data can be a mixed bag. Like it may be harder to get government or B2B data using some of these sources. So the point is you have to develop this very specific hypothesis uh, for more the data dimension. And these are just some examples uh, how we can leverage 
data as well as domain expertise to formulate these hypotheses. So for instance, I talked about the web thing. So we could say, well, if you could get Twitter search and Reddit data that can increase the speed dimension and on the granularity dimension by a faster data collection. And also since we didn't have the metadata earlier about how people search, that's gonna be our top one. Similarly, you can say, well, point of sale data should increase my accuracy, but not increase the coverage by a whole lot because it's going to address only the retail sector. So once again, there's some sample hypothesis in the book chapter and we can use that. So now let's bring it all together to talk a little bit about search versus NFT. So the sample hypothesis we might have is if we use web search, and again, we picked this example because almost all of us understand or have used search data and then we all care about non farm payrolls. So, so search data tends to be more timely as compared to government data. It's gonna be widely applicable to multiple sectors and it's likely to be more accurate since it has the much higher sample size, like literally billions of searches versus the 600,000 employers that get questioned. But the concern is, well, search data could be urban and tech centric, right? So what's the, that's the concern and that's the bias. So let's see what we can do with this. So that's the case study. So the, so the literature uh, so far, there's a good amount of literature, especially in seminal papers like Joy and Varian, who was the chief economist at Google, like really helped launch this literature. Uh, and they have two main findings. And they say that search shows only small improvements and secondly, if you have good existing data sources, they can overcome the benefits of these improvements. So we have three concerns with the literature. The first is most of the macro variables they use uh, or they predict, they have a high trend component. So for example, unemployment rate, you know, 4.5% to 4.3%, so it's going to remain very similar has a very high autoregressive or trend component, similarly with initial jobless claims. Second problem, they don't control for expert forecasts. So what Wall Street is, does Wall Street already know this or do people already know this? If they know this, then it's not new information. It's not orthogonal. So that's not typically not controlled for. And the third critique is the government, if both are noisy, so both government data and search data are noisy, well, which one has better information? How do you resolve this? So, we attempt to address these concerns, but first using non-farm payrolls, which moves markets so we know it has new information and we know it has a much lower trend component, about 60%. So the test has more power. Uh, the second is we do control for Wall Street expectations. And the third is we actually, uh, you know, now cast revisions. So this is crucial. So we now cast revisions of government non-farm payroll numbers. Now these revisions, are a result of more responses coming in to the same survey as I will show you on the future slides. So if these are these are just, if we are now casting more information ahead of time, uh, then we are actually eliminating the problem of more information because there truly was incremental information. So a little bit about down from payroll. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys, you know, more than 600,000 employer sites, they send them you know, this thing by letters or email. And then, you know, they just ask them, well, what's your total number of employees? And they get a few more details on the 12th, uh, the week of that contains the 12th of each month, right? So that's, so that's what they ask and the people can respond by phone even if they want to in the legacy system and they can respond by email and other means. But not everybody responds promptly. So, so, the, so, they, uh, so the blue line shows uh, that's the first responder. So that's that's the first release. So typically, you know, that's the first series of responses. After that is the red line. So that's the second series of responses. And finally, that's the gray line. That's the third series of responses. So just to give you a timeline. So for imagine the January 2018 release. So BLS, you know, collected all this data in the reference week, as I showed using the form in the previous slide. Uh, then they release the data, as we know, typically on the first Friday of the next month. So that they release the data that corresponds to the blue line. So that was 200,000 in this case. 
Well, come March, we revise it up using data from the red line, right? So that's the, that's, it had, they have more data. And then they say, well, actually the number was 239,000. So, so they revised their same number for January. And then finally in April, when they incorporate the data from the gray line and potentially a few other adjustments, they revise the number back down to 176. So that's typically what happens. Web search, on the other hand, is just collecting all the data within January, within the first few weeks of January, right? So that's why it has this, it has this like inbuilt um, lead. Now, NFP, as it comes out in the short run, it moves the markets. So you can see that on the left, this is the two-year changes in two-year bond yield versus the surprise. So this is the actual release minus the Wall Street consensus. So the surprise component in NFP is clearly information and moves the markets. The two-year bond yield moves. The T-stat for this is about nine. So I didn't put the regression line here, but the T-stat's about nine. However, unemployment rate, you know, the, the changes in unemployment has worked to no pattern on that particular day, typically with the two-year bond yield changes. Now for the longer term thing, so there's an intuition for turning points in the business cycle, right? So we talked about the short term, the day of the release, then there's the bigger question of the turning point as the longer term question. So see, so now let's look at this. So the initial number, the initial NFP, right? That's the gray line. So imagine yourself back to 2008. Uh, like, so if you were looking at the numbers, you would say, well, you know, the initial NFP is actually, you know, it's at zero. So it does not, the US economy has not yet gone into recession. However, when you look at the final NFP, you know, you would know a month that's the dashed red line in the final NFP versus, you know, this, this continuous line. If you did have access to the final NFP then, then you would know that US was in recession in June, 2007. Like things, things were going, starting to go down already. So the problem of course is that you don't have access then, you get that the final revised number two to three months later. And this is the link between the turning points and data quality. So the key finding you know, that we had was revisions or data quality in good times is actually much higher as compared to the data quality in bad times. So this is back to the same Ben Bernanke slide, like if for as a portfolio manager, if, imagine you're a doctor, but you, know, you get the most inaccurate vitals on the patient uh, exactly when the patient is sick. So that's a fundamental problem. And the revisions for GDP, NFP, retail sales, these are big releases in good times are about 26 to 47% of their own magnitude. However, in bad times, the revisions shoot up to 80% or 46% or 136% for retail sales, and it's almost meaningless, uh, right? And, and so this is very high and same thing for standard deviation. And these revisions are not random, they're clustered. So if you look at NFP revisions, these are these gray bars are actually recession bars. So if you look at this, then you can see that the you know that in 2008, like this was quite low. Same thing with COVID, like it all got revised down afterwards, and it all got revised up afterwards. So they tend to cluster and they move together. So that's why this is a key point about linking data quality and turning. And then, you know, if you're interested, there's much more, you know, kind of economic theory and details in the book chapter about how these revisions are used and not noise in the MANQ framework, MANQ regressions, and then we also do during the causality and things like that. So, so you can read that in more detail uh, in the book chapter. Uh, now let's talk about search data. So what we did was we made these different categories corresponding as close to the VLS as possible. And for example, insurance jobs in North Carolina, this is some search. We classify that as a sales financing job and it goes overall into the finance category, things like that. So after we did this, then we wanted to know, well, do we have an obvious demographic bias? And then we look at the age distribution and the region distribution. And we see that the amount of, you know, there's not an obvious bias in the data. There's a little, but not so much. Uh, and then we actually just relate the non-farm payroll levels to the searches. 
and, and NFPs and burdened by them. So typically, if you, if you have a job controlling for everything else, you tend to search much less for a new job. If you don't have a job, you search a lot more. Uh, and that's what we find. We see that they line up. This is both non-seasonally adjusted, so they both line up reasonably well. So intuition is working fine. Uh, and then we do some, we, we actually take the curated search sectors. So these are different sectors for job searches that correspond to the BLS that I was showing before. So these are architecture and engineering jobs, job related to art, business construction, et cetera. And then we take those searches and we do the correlation with the NFP. So the gray lines are the correlation with the initial NFP and the red lines are correlation with the final NFP. So right away, you can see that the correlations with final NFP are much higher, which means that the potentially the data, you know, the information content in search data, which is available in January is already very high and contains all the information for final NFP, which will only be available later uh, if you follow the government. And this brings us to the main regression. So, so you know, I won't, I won't dwell on the table, which is there uh, in, in the paper. Uh, however, the, you know, the picture provides an easy illustration. So on the left is analyst information. Uh, and before, and these are all standardized, so you can easily compare them. So before the NF initial number is released, this high rectangle shows that analyst information or Wall Street analysts, they actually have a lot of information. However, as soon as the initial number NFP is released, uh, then the information content of that goes to zero. So basically, uh, you know, so you can look at that, the information analyst survey is 0.45, the three stars, and it goes back right down to 0.1. And the T stat goes from 4.6 to plus 0.1, right? So it's just, so it, it, it has a lot of information, but it seems most of that information is captured by the initial release of NFP, right? Boom, nothing. However, search, it starts off with a little bit less information. So it's minus 0.2, it is statistically significant. Uh, and it's, so that's lower amount of information on an absolute basis versus all the Wall Street analysts. However, even when the initial number is released and we control for lags and all sorts of other things, the amount of information remains relatively similar. And the T-STAT actually, if you look at searches, it remains so roughly similar, minus point, minus two, minus two, minus two, right? So, 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 the, so the information content is statistically significant, it's economically significant, uh, and it, it's orthogonal. It remains there even after you control for lags and you know, initial numbers and volatile analysts and all sorts of things. Of course, if you curate a particular sector and you tune it, so to speak, to have more information content, then you can get much higher predictability. But our point thus far was just to verify the hypothesis that, hey, does it have unique orthogonal and, uh, you know, information that stays behind after revisions? So that's what it shows. Now, what, what's going on behind the scenes? So we actually investigated, well, we, we had talked about the bias of search data, right? So they have a bias towards urban, potentially white collar, uh, urban tax centric bias. So in this case, it turns out, so BLS actually did the search and well, who are these people who don't respond to us? Who are the people who don't respond to these NFP surveys? Uh, so this is a really cool paper by these researchers, Tips and Toff. And this is a decision tree that shows who are less likely to respond. So on the left is less likely to respond, and on the right is more likely to respond. So on the left, so when you see this, you see that employer is greater than 20. So this means that you know, a bigger firm is less likely to respond. Then WCS means white collar. So these are white collar. So if you're a white collar, you're even less likely to respond. So if high, lots of employees, white collar, and multi means you're located in a population where it's more than a billion. So it's, it's multi-city. So, so you are, if you, if you live in a city, urban, uh, you work in a white collar job and you work for a big employer, well, that employer is least likely to respond as compared to others. So in this particular case, it looks like some of the urban bias and white collar actually was helpful because there's a large differential in the information supply versus demand. 
So basically, all of us, we demand lots of information from the search engine, but we are very less willing to supply information to the government. So that differential is helpful here. That brings us to the question, well, which technique should we use? Uh, and, you know, which machine learning technique? So we have, we have proved that it has, you know, has some potential signal, what to extract the signal, make the most predictive model. The question is which technique? Uh, and there, once again, in the book chapter, I go through all the different machine learning techniques. And this is actually the mean square error ratios of the production model that we have versus the actual model that we made. And then you can see that, you know, random forest, ridge lasso, et cetera, you know, simple techniques, uh, but more machine learning oriented, they do a lot better than linear regression. That's the yellow line. And of course, there's much more details about prune boosting and all sorts of other techniques in the book chapter. Uh, so that's that's what we find. Uh, and now, so so what we did was to bring it all together where we have the interpretability of strategists and data engineers and researchers uh, on a cloud native tech stack. So that's our global now testing platform. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, and once again, back to the suboptimal investment and social experiences. So this, this is a little bit of a sneak peek of what our platform experience is like. So this is here, the, the red line is actually the government data. So that's a little slow. So that's the now cast for, in this case, for India. So we talked about the US, now we're just showing India. Uh, so this Indian government, this shows the COVID did. So you will notice that our now cast that's in gold, was actually leading uh, the government now cast since we are current and the Indian government now cast is two months lag and all of this is on a cloud native platform. Um, so, and as a result, you know, well, hopefully it's gonna enable everybody to achieve better investment outcomes. So this is an example of a tactical allocation strategy that does better simply because we are able to, you know, you cannot predict, you're not trying to predict the COVID dip, but if in real time, we know that there's a big COVID dip, you know, that strategy is able to rotate out of being very long, the Bombay Stock Exchange, right, the index. And, and similarly, when we have a recovery, it is more confident to go back in and say, look, actually in real time, we are seeing a massive recovery and goes back in. And on the other side for social, right now we have, you know, projects going on with more than 30 graduate students who are using, who are working with us, and they're actually estimating some of these data, which is going to be released completely to open source, totally free uh, to open source. So that's that's what we are doing on the other side, on the social side. So now back to key takeaways. Uh, so I would say alternative data and ML are very exciting, but a double-edged sword, and now casting is not just an ML problem. So, the second is domain expertise and specific hypotheses of different data are crucial. And the third, I would suggest, is improving data quality and better turning point identification are linked. Uh, and machine learning techniques obviously are very helpful too, especially with non-linearity. And that's why it's a very exciting time uh, to be doing this at a global scale. So with that, so thank you. And I guess we'll open up for questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Approve. This is this was fantastic and uh, so timely and exciting. So I want to remind the audience that if you have a question that you have not submitted beforehand, now your chance to submit your questions, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them now or later. But you received uh, close to thirty questions beforehand, so we're going to maybe touch upon a few of them. Uh, you have seen some of them, Are there any particular one that you want to address, or I could, I could sort of uh, pick a few from from the list? Uh, sure, I, I can I can address you know like a series that I remember, Hussein, and then you can please you know pick questions you find appropriate from the list. So sure. one question asked like how can we know the value of now casting and uh, you know things along that line? How can we settle this internally? How do we know the value? So that was one of the things that was helpful at Microsoft, uh, where we actually ran this internal fund to know how much value the data had. So, you know, the outperformance to benchmark file quite noisy, as we know from finance uh, theory, it's noisy, but it's a very effective way to prove 
uh, that the data does have some signal. So just as an example, like we actually, you know, we took two things, we did two things. We looked at government, we did a simple tactical asset allocation strategy. Now this is very simple by design, where the thick white line is just the Bombay Stock Exchange, it's just the Indian index that you would have. And the dashed lines are, what if you ran a tactical asset allocation where you said, oh, if the economy is going down, I'm gonna pull money out of the stock market. And if it's recovering, I'm going to put money back in. It's that simple, right? Like there's a growth shock, it's gonna impact stock negatively, so I'm gonna pull money out. So if this is meant to stimulate what most investor, you know, potentially investors might do if they don't, if they only have the lack government data. And then you can see that this is a typical five week lag of the data or five to eight week lag, but you tend to seems underperform and there's not a lot of information content because it's all by and large priced in. However, you know, if you, if you actually look at the same strategy, but you're able to actually, you know, have the data ahead of time about only a one week lag, uh, then the same strategy, you know, because in real time, you're able to outperform. Uh, and we actually did something, let's see if I have that here. Yeah, we actually said, well, is, is it coming from being faster? So we actually lag, we actually just lagged our own strategy by another week and then by a third week. And then you can see, as we start lagging the strategy by the third week, it pretty much reaches, I mean, it's a little higher because it's higher quality. So think of the two things, it's higher speed and higher quality. So, but most of the signal here in India is coming from speed and some from quality. So you can see as we start lagging it, one week, and this is the one week lag, thick, this line, the dotted lines are like a two week lag, so it's already lower. And then you have a three week lag, that's the dashes, that's pretty close to the index. And, that, and then you go to four and five weeks, we saw what happens with the government data. So that's just one way I would suggest to you. Right, so th this is fascinating. So uh, you can see that the value added basically, if I'm correct, really shows itself at these turning points or critical points or uh, points of sort of distress in the market. You know, you, you can look at that chart and you can see that prior to 2020, there was some value added, but a significant yeah. amount basically uh, is realized right about the COVID. Uh, is that a good, is that the right take uh, or or not? Yeah, I would say that's a very good way to put it because when you think about you know when you think about the turning points, um, you know like alternative data have their own noise. So if it's really something macro, you know that macro shop by definition moves the whole thing, right? So alternative data have their own noise, but exactly in times of macro, uh, then it actually that's when it proves its value. So this, this is COVID was a huge shock. So credit card spend and you know searches and satellites, they may have their own noise, but as soon as it's a macro shock at this turning point, we find that it identifies the whole thing so much better. So it actually, that's when all these data move uh, a lot and that's when it identifies. See, that's exactly right. So yeah. maybe in a moment I can, pull up another chart, but you can keep working the questions to bring back to this. Sure, sure. So how stable all these are these relationships, you know, the variables that you're using, quote unquote, to not cast the uh, macroeconomic variable, are, are they pretty stable or this has to be re-estimated and relearned over time? Yeah. And especially when things are sort of a bit distressful, what, what, what's, what's the sort of the big view there? Yeah, that's a great question. So. So, I mean, the, one of the issues with alternative data is actually that they tend to be noisier. Uh, you know, they, they're hard to maintain. Like Google can change its normalization algorithm and bam, suddenly you have a new data set. So, you know, it's just, it's just actually quite challenging uh, to maintain and clean the data relatively well. But one good thing is alternative data actually uh, you know, it, for surveys, like people in India were not answering surveys. Like it was in, in during COVID, at times when government shut down even trains and people are trying to get back to their home state. So this mm -hmm. is the, like literally hundreds of millions of people traveling across the country. Well, they're not answering surveys when they're stuck in trains. But if you look from the satellites and you look to other sources, we're able to see that, oh, look, you know, like, like emissions and, and you know, night lights, and credit card spend and mobility 
and all those things have come down massively, right? So that's a very powerful signal. And additionally, it's come down across not just one city, but 25 major cities or 50 major cities. So then we have very become very comfortable with the idea uh, that actually uh, this is going on. So actually I'll relate this to turning points a little bit, Hussein. So mm -hmm. let me see if I can share this uh, slide here. Uh, so what we did was we actually looked at big shocks and medium shocks and small shocks, as I said before, and this relates to how accurate we were versus the government, right? So this, mm -hmm. so this dot plot is, of course, we have the speed advantage. So if we take away the speed advantage, like how fast were we with the, with the government? So for the big shocks, we really line up. So that, as I was referring to, were the macro shocks uh, that move everything. So alternative data sources move, government data sources move, they all move together. So this really lines up. For small shocks, well, you know, Google could have changed its strategy. Credit cards could have had a, you know, an event like or some promotions or whatever. So those small shocks, you know, they're not, they're, they don't do as well. Uh, that's some of the noise. Uh, but, and the medium shocks, it does tend to line up. And of course, as you get more and more data sources, right, even potentially we could start doing more small shocks and that's kind of the trajectory uh, mm. of progress. That makes sense. Interesting. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in last whatever year or so, inflation has become really important, right? I mean, everyone is paying attention to inflation. So yeah. certain economic variables kind of assume importance at different points in time, I guess you can say. Uh, how much uh, work does it take to say, okay, we are not looking at not casting inflation, but now we're going to look at inflation. Is it sort of, is there a spillover effect benefit from what you've done on NFP to inflation or you have to just start from scratch and basically develop a unique model to deal with inflation? No, no, it's not a unique model. It really does develop. So I can maybe quickly share something here. So this is just, I mean, I actually didn't mean to share. I'm not sure that. Um, for, so for well, you example, can just explain it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I can just quickly share. So for example, um, so let's wait till, yeah, it pulled up. So, you know, we actually look at the, you know, we look at like demand, supply, sorry, it's frozen. That's the nature of the knowledge. Um, but we look at the, you know, demand, uh, demand, supply. And if you think back to Stock and Watson, well, the reason they started now casting uh, is actually to, to let me, yeah, that's fine. I'll just answer it. Uh, okay, sure. The reason they started now casting is they actually wanted to, they thought that's a good way to estimate inflation eventually. So growth shock in their mind was the relationship to inflation, uh, kind of the Phillips curve and all that. So, so I think, I think we have, so that's, that was the reason to do this. Um, and that's why for us, like they're not separate, like it's a part of understanding the macroeconomy. So if you understand growth and then you're like, well, this is what's happening to aggregate demand. So, you know, that's what's going to happen to um, inflation. And I think I may be able to, let's see, may be able to share the screen now that it's calm down. Um, so here. So for example, we are able to look at, this is the inflation turning down. We're able to look at yeah. US demand, which is still popping up a little, right? The key things driving inflation are demand and supply. So you can just think of a now cost as really trying to understand aggregate demand very well, the growth aspect. Uh -huh. uh, and then the supply aspect uh, is, is additional, but these together can help better understand inflation. And you asked an interesting question about, for example, jobs. So for example, if you look at job postings all over, then you can see that job postings are coming down and what's happening. So, so they're all very related uh, to, to inflation. So hmm. I'll, yeah, I'll go back. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, I guess everyone probably have in the back of their mind that of now casting sort of some more micro data and how about, you know, Microsoft's earnings or, or Apple's earnings and so on. Is, 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 is that possible or just we don't have enough data or is too much noise? Have you looked into it at all? What, what are your thoughts on that? 
So we focus largely on macro as I guess as yeah. a part of our DNA, like, you know, I was mostly doing sure, macro. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And then for big asset managers, the big question of macro, what's going to happen to the economy is, is generally yeah. they're always very important. Like asset allocation drives a lot of the returns. However, I think there's lots of firms doing amazing work on now casting earnings. I feel it's a little bit harder because uh, GDP, uh, honestly, macro, like you actually have some data that's at least monthly. However, quarterly company earnings come out every quarter and they typically try to relate credit card mobility and sentiment and a few others. Those are, is my understanding, the major sources being used. Uh, so, and I think, I think they're doing something interesting there. It's certainly doable, um, but you know, our focus is macro. Yeah. Uh, something I noticed in your presentation uh, that uh, you know, to, to the extent that uh, the initial releases are uh, are are biased, and of course, to what extent they are reflected in uh, in the Wall Street expectations and so on. I think those surprises probably would also add value in some sort of a option or volatility strategy. You know, if you think there's going to be a big surprise, of course, volatility is going to shoot through the roof. So you didn't present it, but I think there might be even more value in using your sort of now casting to do uh, uh, trade on volatility uh, rather than actually the direction of the market. So it's quite fascinating. Very fascinating. That's, a, that's a great point, actually. It is something we're in the middle of developing right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> great mind things alike, I guess, as they say. <laughs> uh, now, um, stop sharing this, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have one question from the list that was uh, uh, that was offered is that uh, about uh, the, sort of the policy effect. You mentioned that at the be very beginning, the Ben Bernanke and so on. Uh, is, is there sort of uh, an effort on the part of the national governments, especially U.S. and U.K. and maybe developed market, to actually release or use your techniques to release some sort of an casting or more updated sort of? Uh, macroeconomic data or are you stuck with the sort of the slow and inaccurate ones? I mean, it's a, it's a mixed bag. So I, so I would say most, for example, there's some, you know, great books that talk about the severe under-resourcing of very talented people like in Africa and developing countries, right? Like, so they're severely under-resourced in the statistical office. Yeah. So they, they're very talented, but under-resourced. So, so they're finding it difficult. They continue to find it difficult. Uh, however, the developing countries like U.S. and, and U.K., they, they are definitely starting to understand now casting, and they've even written some really, they've done some very good work. The big problem, it seems, based on my private conversations with some very senior people across these banks, like I visited at the Federal Reserve and I given talks at the Central Canadian Central Bank and such. So it seems like getting the technology part and also getting access to lots of alternative data is actually the difficult part for them. Mm. Uh, like they, once somebody told me a story of a very senior person going to almost governor level uh, at the central bank I won't name, uh, but they basically said and wanted all this computation power to run these things and the, the IT department basically was not cooperative. Yeah. So it just was like a very, you know, a little bit of a bureaucratic hurdle on top of that who's going to pay for all the alternative data and are you really going to be able to try a hundred sources to find the 10 good ones? Yeah, well, more, more demand for your services uh, <laughs> if they're not doing it, yeah. Well, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, you know, this is just uh, unbelievably relevant, of course. And uh, uh, we look forward to you know, maybe reading or having you come and actually do a demonstration of your uh, of, of your platform, uh, which is something we didn't get a chance. We saw some pictures of it, but we didn't see the whole thing. So again, thank you so much. And for our audience, of course, there is the link and information about FTP and the video of, uh, of, the, of this presentation will appear there. And of course, check our website for an upcoming uh, webinar uh, as well. Again, thank you so much, Approve. This was fascinating, one of the more exciting webinars we've had and uh, you have a good day.